Let's take some time to do a formative assessment review and to look at tips for developing traditional multiple choice questions. So here is our learning objective. We want to be able to understand the differences between formative and summative applications of assessment and know how and when to use each. We also want to be able to balance the use of an effective range of formative and summative assessment strategies to support, verify, and document learning. Now, as educators, we often ask ourselves this, how do we and our students know if we are ready to move on to the next step and or apply knowledge and skills that we're working on in a more difficult context? This is why we need formative assessment. Formative assessment helps our learners focus on three important questions. Where am I going? Where am I at right now? And how do I close the gap between where I need to go and where I am at the moment? In the scriptures, I'm fascinated by these references to watchmen in the tower. These are individuals who have a post high up above a vineyard where they keep watch for potential problems and dangers. Similarly, we have a role as teachers to constantly be on the watch as we gather and process information about the successes and struggles of our students. So as we seek to define formative assessment, we might consider this. Formative assessment is a process used by teachers and students during instruction that provides feedback to adjust ongoing teaching and learning in order to improve students' achievement of intended instructional outcomes. Now, in reality, most teachers employ simple self-assessment strategies to some degree or another with their students. This can, for example, include asking students to self-report their own understanding of a concept using their thumbs to indicate a degree of understanding such as thumbs up for I understand this and I can explain it to others. Thumb to the side, which indicates that the student thinks they understand but would love to double check with the classmate. Or a thumbs down to indicate that they are still really confused. Other informal formative assessment strategies include exit tickets where students might record a summary of what was learned or mastered during the day, as well as a question they still have based on what was covered. In addition, color-coded cards or a simple three-point finger scale can be used by a student to communicate to the teacher their own level of understanding. Another common use of informal formative assessment is when teachers check for understanding with questions. After trying a few practice problems, Teachers can ask their students to put their heads down and show with their right hand how many of those problems did you get correct. We can also ask our students what questions they have before they're asked to try a new skill or concept on their own. Or we could prompt students by saying, put your heads down, show me with your thumbs how confident you are feeling right now about your ability to, and then insert a description of the knowledge or skill that we're working on. But when we talk about more systematic formative assessment, we need to understand that formative assessment is a process, not any particular activity or test. It is used not just by teachers, but by both teachers and students. As for when do we administer formative assessment, formative assessment takes place during instruction. This is done in order to provide assessment-based feedback to teachers and to students. The function of this feedback is to help teachers and students make adjustments that will improve students' achievement and learning. The more information we are able to collect about our students, the more accurately we are able to assess what is just the right gap or the zone of proximal development. In other words, this is the distance between what the student can accomplish during independent problem solving and the level of problem solving that can be accomplished under the guidance of an adult or in collaboration with a more expert peer. Now, the teacher's task is to use formative assessment to identify and build on immature but maturing structures and through collaboration and guidance to facilitate cognitive growth. In this process, the student internalizes the resources required for solving a particular problem, and they become part of his or her independent developmental achievement. In other words, as a student struggles, they get better, develop more knowledge and skills, and their capacity to improve as learners. In order to make this happen, teachers have to be on the watch, gathering evidence, to determine if students have met the learning criteria, if they're on the way to meeting the criteria, if they are showing problems, misconceptions, or difficulties. We also have to be able to identify a possible range of responses that students might make to the formative assessment strategy and decide what pedagogical action will be appropriate to help them meet their learning needs. 
Unfortunately, one of the most common approaches when students need extra support is to simply reteach. In other words, we show students the exact same thing one more time. We need to understand that mostly adapting instruction will not just involve reteaching a concept in the same way that it's been taught. Instead, if students don't get it right the first time, we should consider adopting a different approach to teaching the concept or skills and extra opportunities to practice. In other words, instruction takes place in a different way, often in a different or smaller setting. This is when differentiated instruction becomes so important. In other words, tailoring our instruction to help meet our students' needs. One way that we can do this is by forming flexible subgroups for instruction. As we gather evidence of student learning, as well as student struggles, teachers can create need-based groups when formative assessment shows that there are students at similar levels of understanding. As teachers work with these smaller, more focused groups, they can target their instruction to meet specific student needs. It's important to keep in mind that these subgroups need to be formed flexibly. In other words, they are not fixed because even though the students may have the same learning need in relation to a particular skill or concept, their needs will change and therefore regrouping will be necessary. Another way that we can differentiate our instruction or tailor instruction to meet our students' needs is to engage groups in different learning tasks related to the same concept, but always pitched at the range of learning levels represented in the classroom. So for example, students might be learning the same concept or skill, but the tasks will be at different levels of complexity depending on what the formative assessment evidence we collect reveals about our students' learning. One of the most powerful ways that we can differentiate instruction is to work with individual students, particularly for those students who are experiencing real problems and for whom the whole class teaching or subgroup learning just is not working. Now, in the end, no one strategy to differentiating instruction will be the answer. That's why we as teachers must use a range of methods to differentiate instruction depending on the learning need at hand. Instead of being rigid in how we approach instruction, we need to be flexible and nimble in how we implement our methods of instruction. So now let's look at one approach that allows us to gather quite a bit of student data very quickly. Let's look at designing selected response or what we call traditional or multiple choice items. So the truth is that there are many types of traditional items. There are interpretive items where we ask students to look and interpret info from a text, a graph, a chart, a graphic. We can also pose students those questions that ask them to choose the best answer. In other words, students have to choose between the best choice from a few plausible choices by looking closely and evaluating each choice. There are, of course, those questions that ask students to choose all that are correct. In other words, multiple correct responses. Some traditional items are actually incomplete statements that ask students to complete the missing part of a statement. And there are always true or false and matching items. All of these are what we refer to as traditional items. So for now, let's just focus on multiple choice questions. Here we have the anatomy or parts of a multiple choice question. We have the first part that is the stem. This is the question or incomplete statement that prompts student thinking. In this case, we have one correct answer. It's located here at the bottom. It is choice E. And that makes the other choices, A, B, C, and D, the distractors. Or in other words, plausible but incorrect answers. So to start us off, let's look at seven general suggestions for writing better multiple choice or traditional items. The first one is to make sure that we have multiple items for the same skill or concept. The second one is to minimize the reading time for each item. Next, we have the need to include the central idea and most of the phrase in the stem. Fourth, we want to avoid using negative phrasing. Fifth, we try and make all choices plausible, mutually exclusive, and of equal length. Then, we want to make sure that we avoid verbatim phrasing from classroom materials as often as we can. And, we always want to try to avoid verbiage when we write our items. So, let's look at each of these seven suggestions in greater detail. Our first suggestion was to have multiple items for the same skill or concept. Let's say that the skill or concept we want to gather evidence of is whether or not students are able to explain the origins of the biosphere. Now, we wouldn't just give them one question in the same way that if this were an intelligence test, I wouldn't want somebody to ask me just one single question to determine my level of intelligence. 
I really think that I would like multiple opportunities to demonstrate my intelligence. In the same way, we want to have multiple items for the same skill or concept. For example, here we have four different questions, all of which will help us begin to gather an understanding of to what degree our students can explain the origins of the biosphere. Our second suggestion for writing better multiple choice questions is to try to minimize the reading time for each item. For example, let's look at a sample test question that involves far too much unnecessary reading. This is undesirable. It says, look carefully at the phrasing and word choice utilized by the author in line five of the text. According to your analysis of the speaker, the prophet's word of the weapons will probably not be heeded largely due to. Then if you look down here, we have very wordy choices as well. Human beings profound interest, enthrallment, and fascination with conflict and weaponry. The reality that complexity of nature is far more fascinating than the thrills of warfare. And so on and so on and so on. We want to seek to minimize the reading time for each item. A more desirable test question might look like this. According to the speaker, the prophet's word of the weapons in line five will probably not be heeded because, notice that we're able to capture the same prompt with far fewer words. We can also ensure that our distractors and our correct choice contain as few words as possible. A multiple choice question written like this is far more desirable because it minimizes the reading time for each item on the part of the student. A third suggestion is to include the central idea of what is being assessed in most of the STEM. So if you look down here, here's an undesirable item. The STEM simply says psychology dot dot dot. Instead, we could include more of the central idea in the STEM, something like this. The science of mind and behavior is called in addition, we want to make sure that we're including words that might otherwise be repeated in each choice. That goes for our answer as well as the distractors. So for example, we do not want something like this. In the national elections in the United States, the president is officially chosen by the people, chosen by members of the Congress, chosen by the House of Representatives, chosen by, you get the point. We could and should take this repetitive phrase and place it in the stem. Another suggestion is for each of us to try to avoid negative phrasing. And then when we use negative phrasing, we need to underline, capitalize, or bring attention to the negative word. For example, we don't want something like this. Which of the following is not cited as an accomplishment of the Kennedy administration? We want to explore ways to write the question without the word not. Think, for example, of a time that you read a question too quickly. You knew the answer, but failed to notice that not was part of the stem. That's why if we are going to include not or some sort of negative phrasing in the stem, we want to make sure that we underline, capitalize, and draw attention to it. I would even suggest that once an assessment is handed out, asking students to pause and go to whatever test questions have negative phrasing, then to underline or circle those to help ensure that they don't accidentally answer it incorrectly. Another thing we need to keep in mind is that all of our choices need to be plausible or believable. We don't want to have giveaway choices. For example, digestion, assimilation, respiration, Idahoan. All of these have a similar structure and a similar context, where this is obviously not going to be a choice considered seriously by a student. Instead, we should seek to make all of the choices equally plausible. But we also need to make sure that they are mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means that there is not overlap between the different choices. For example, we don't want something like this. The daily minimum required amount of milk that a 10 year old child should drink is one to two glasses, two to three glasses, three to four glasses, at least four glasses. Here we see overlap with two here and two here, as well as three in both of these choices. We even see four in both choices C and D. Instead, we should design this question in a way that makes the choices mutually exclusive. For example, one glass, two glasses, three glasses, and four glasses. Without overlap between the choices, this question is far less confusing. And we cannot forget to make each of our choices an equal length. If we are not careful when we write traditional items and choices, we can accidentally make the correct answer the longest one. 
Many students have learned, when in doubt, pick the longest answer or the one with the most academic jargon. That's why a more desirable approach would be to make sure that each of the choices are of an equal length. Doing so takes a little bit of time and informal measurement with our eyes to make sure that each one is about the same length. Another suggestion is to work to avoid verbatim phrasing from classroom materials and or discussion in our distractors. So let's say that we have choices A, B, C, and D. And our correct answer is A, but in one of our distractors, either B, C, or D, we include a phrase that we talked about quite a bit in class. Even though a student might think that A is the correct answer, they often second guess themselves because they think something like, let me see, hmm, that reminds me of something I read or heard in class, so it must be correct. Our seventh suggestion is to avoid verbiage, or confusing words or language. These are words like, well, for example, verbiage. See if you can read through this question and find examples of verbiage, or confusing words or language. Too many confusing words or too much use of confusing language makes it difficult for a student to demonstrate understanding or mastery of a skill. Now, one final tip is to make sure that we work to create questions with varied degrees of difficulty. So as an example, here's a picture of a rock climbing gym that my sons and I recently went to. When you get up close to a large rock climbing wall, you'll see that there will be levels for beginners, for intermediate, for advanced, the design is such to challenge climbers at different levels. We can do the same with our multiple choice questions. Multiple choice questions don't need to be limited to demonstrating knowledge and understanding of a concept or skill. In fact, we can take a look at Bloom's taxonomy and work to develop the same question at different levels. So we could assess Newton's three laws of motion at the level of remembering. What are Newton's three laws of motion? We could also ask students to explain three laws of motion, focusing more on understanding. By looking carefully at Bloom's taxonomy, we can design questions that focus on different cognitive skills. For example, here is the same concept written at the level of evaluation. It says, would A, conservation of energy, or B, conservation of momentum, be more appropriate for solving the following dynamics problem? We should seek out resources that help us to write questions at different levels, knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, as well as evaluation. We can do this by focusing on key words that seem to best fit this cognitive skill and experiment with a variety of questions that lend themselves to each level. In summary, writing good traditional multiple choice questions takes time, effort, and practice in applying each of these suggestions.